Today we're going to speak about why get fired up on Lach Bomer. Why get fired up? We're not pyromaniacs. Uh, so let's see what the sources say about Lach Bomer. Yehuda was, was kind enough to hand out the papers. One paper. What, what, what's, why play with fire? Why play with fire on Lach Bomer? Uh, According to the Zohar, uh, Rajbi died on Lag Bomer. And when he died, say I read, it was a pillar of fire hovering over the house as they escorted his body to the cemetery. So that's the Zohar's interpretation. There was an Aish, like we had in the Midbar, Amur Aish, Abraham Amur Aish. So when he died on the late afternoon on Lag Bomer, there was a pillar of fire accompanying his body to the cemetery. Okay, now. The Shulchan Aruch is very short. It says in Lag Bomer, Marvin Tzapi Simcha. We increase joy a little bit, says the Shulchan Aruch. You don't say Tachnun, because that's when the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, they stopped what? They stopped dying. They stopped dying. And we'll see why they died and what's it all about. Uh, the Ariyah Kodesh says something incredible. When the yard side of somebody, what do you do, Abraham? You light a outside candle. So the Zohar says, is the air conditioner on? Yes, it's It's on? If you're hot, you can tell the lady. Uh, the Ariya Kodesh says that you light fires on the, like Bomer, it's the outside of the Rajbi, it's one giant outside candle. You hear this, Abraham? It's one giant outside candle, according to the Ariya Kodesh, it's the outside of the Rajbi, and when someone dies, you light a outside candle, so it's one gigantic Yotzai candle, okay? When did the Rajbi die? The Rajbi, I just said, the Rajbi died on Lag Vomer. No, That's his Yotzai, 2,000 years ago. Oh. So, uh, uh, right? So it's a Yotzai candle. It's a Yotzai candle. Oh, there are many other interpretations of why we light a fire. The Torah, when the day that he died, he revealed the Zohar. He revealed the hidden aspects of the Torah. The Torah is called Eshdat. In Pasha Zois Bracha, the Torah is called Eshdat. What does Eshdat mean? A fiery law. In, in the end of the Torah. Ksuva ve'eshchora al eshlavana. The Talmud says the Torah is written on black fire, on white fire, light my fire, and therefore, like Baomer is the day the Rashbi revealed the Zohar, the hidden aspects of the Torah, so we write light fires because the Torah is compared to what? Deuteronomy 32, the Torah is compared to what? Fire. And the Torah is given amidst fire, right? We're going to read on Shavuos, the whole mountain was ablaze. Har Sinai became a volcano. God gave the, to the, the fiery Torah, Deuteronomy 32, from the midst of a fire. Why is the Torah compared to what? Fire. Well, to answer this question, we got to what? The Talmud in Yuma 72 makes a strange statement. A person can be a Torah scholar, and if he has merits, the Torah for him becomes Samachayim, a potion of life. Love, potion of life. Loizacha. A person can be a Torah scholar and he has no merit. The Torah, if it comes for him, a Sama Mavet. Potion of death, tractate Yuma 72. A person can be a Torah scholar. If he has good midot, the Torah for him is a potion of life. A Torah scholar with no good midot, Yuma 72 says, that becomes for him a potion of death. The Torah is compared to fire. If fire is handled and managed, it's obviously very constructive. But if fire is mishandled, it can be very destructive. Tamidi Rabbi Kiva were great Torah scholars, but they didn't have menschlachkeit. So the Torah, what? Consumed them. The same Torah, Eshtat, the Torah is giving them its fire, a fiery Torah. If it's handled properly with good midot, the Torah is very constructive. But if you play with fire and you don't handle it right, it can what? Burn you up. And that's exactly what happened to the what? Talmidi Rabbi Akiva, great Torah scholars. 
but they didn't have their acheret kodmalat Torah. They said, my way or the highway? That's what they said. So the constructive Torah destruct, destroyed them. Hmm. Pasuk in Mishle, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. The human soul is compared to what? Candle of God. Torah is given in a fire. Again, fire. How did God reveal himself at Mount Sinai? God revealed himself as a burning fire on top of the mountain. Abi Exodus 24. Again, fire. Fire has to be handled properly. And what? Handle with care. Or you can get burned. Also, God appears like a fire. Fire is the only thing in the physical world. Everything in the physical world, Avi, if you take away, you have less. Right? You have a pound of potatoes, and I give you a half a pound. I'm, I'm less. A gallon of water, I give you a half a gallon, I have less. Everything in the physical world, if you give away, you have less. Fire is the only thing in the physical world where you can take, and you don't have less. You can light a million candles from one candle. I'm not talking about the wax. Avi, you can light a million candles from one candle. Would that original candle be diminished? No. Why not? Nothing else in the physical world, if you take away, you diminish, you have less, except fire. So therefore, God appears in a flame of fire. God is constantly giving and giving and giving his life force. The last posseh kuntilim. We're not an automatic pilot. Every breath we take, it's a gift from Hashem. So normally when you give, what? You have less. So God says, no, look at the fire. Fire, you can keep taking and that flame will not be diminished, won't be reduced. So God says, I'm like the flame. I'm constantly giving, giving the breath of life on and on. And yet I am not diminished. But you can't relate to that. Unless you look, Avi, at a flame. And therefore, in Exodus 24, by Matan Torah, God appeared to us as what? Ke'eshochelet baroshahar, as a fire. He appeared to Moses in a flame of fire. Talmidi Rabbi Akiva, they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. They didn't have a left tov. B'nai Yisoscha, my great great grandfather says, that the, the sphere is, is divided up into two sections. From the first day until the 32nd day, 32 in Hebrew is lev. Right? Heart. You gotta have heart. Lots and lots of heart. And then from Lak Bomer to the end is how many days? 17. How do you say 17 in Hebrew? Tov. Tov is gematria what? Tet vav bet avi. You're good in gematria. Is it gematria how much? 17. So the tafkid of sphere to almost to acquire a left tov. Unfortunately, these guys, they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. And they did not acquire a left tov because derecheret kodmala Torah. Menchelkeit comes before what? The Torah. Otherwise, the Torah can burn you up. Handle with care. Isn't that incredible? Well, now, many people take off on Lag Bomer. They go hiking. Oh, the other day we took a hike. Well, we mavatl Torah. You take off Lag Bomer. We took off the other day. Well, we mavatl Torah. What? I think we're seeing the land of Israel. There's a strange Mishnah. Please hear me, hear me well. The Mishnah says, if someone is walking on the road, taking a tour, and he stops studying to admire the beautiful orchard or the meadow, mitchayeh b'nafsho, that person is going to be punished. But I don't understand. The Vilna Gaon says, I don't know, the Mishnah says, you're walking, on, you're taking a tour to a beautiful God's country, and you stop learning, and you say, how beautiful is this site, beautiful mountain, beautiful Golan Heights, you're going to be punished. 
says the Vilna Gaon, ich verstehe nicht. Because the Rambam says, how do you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? It's not enough to study Torah, Avram. To be madly in love with the one above, you have to study Torah, but you also have to admire God's beautiful world. You have to admire and appreciate God's beautiful banyas, Niagara Falls, Swiss Alps, or the beautiful Golan Heights. So how would the Rambam learn this Mishnah? So the Vilna Gaon says, the Mishnah is very, very careful. If you are taking a tour and you think that's stopping to study Torah, if you want to put God in a box, if you think God is only found where? In the pages of the Talmud, and you don't see God in the beautiful Golan Heights, you don't see God in the wings of a butterfly, you've got a major problem, mister. The Mishnah is so exact. Someone is uh, uh, taking a hike, a tour, and he thinks that's stopping to study Torah? Mitchaya benafsho. Says the Vilna Gon, no, don't put God in a box. God is not just found in the pages of the Talmud, on the Chumash. If you have the right hashkafa, how do you say that in English, Avi? The right perspective. You never have to stop studying Torah. If you took the, we took the tour the other day, and we admired beautiful God's Golan Heights and his beautiful flowers. Then you never stop studying Torah. It depends on your perspective and your outlook. We didn't stop studying Torah, because God says in order to be madly in love with the one above, not enough to study Torah. You got to take a hike with Rav Shalom Pollock. You got to take a tour. Ah. God is in every aspect of creation, not just in the books, in the yeshiva. With the right perspective, you never stop studying Torah. To see God in every event, understand that every element of existence reflects spiritual truth. Even a beautiful rose or a beautiful butterfly. When you're admiring a rose, what are you doing, Nechama? Admiring the rose? Or being madly in love with the one above? Two people could admire a rose and, uh, or admire a babbling brook. You ever heard of babbling brook? One guy is doing nothing, and the other guy is doing what, Avram? He's falling madly in love with the one above. Isn't that incredible? Ooh, admiring beauty is like fire. It can be constructive with the proper perspective, or it can be what? Destructive. If you detach it from God. Ooh, you make the call. We create our own reality, Avi. You take a nature hike. Two people on the same nature hike, admiring the Golan Heights. One guy is doing a mitzvah of being madly in love with the one above, and the other guy is what? Wasting his time. It depends on your perspective. You create your own reality. Are you with me on this? Yes. Wow. So the, the Tuesday, we didn't waste our time. We were madly, I told you, we were madly in love with the one above. We were admiring and appreciating God's beautiful country. And God's beautiful, you know, there's more flowers in Israel than any other country. You can Google it. There are more species of birds that pass by here than any other country. What? That's all for our entertainment. God wants to entertain little old me. How could I not be madly in love with him? So with that attitude, Nechama, you never stop studying Torah. The Mishnah says, if you think that's stopping to study Torah, Mr. you got a problem. That's, that's the pshat. So let's take a look at side number one. What's it all about? Why are we mourning? And what's like Baomer? Side number one. So the, the, if you take, it, it's in English. I think it's in English, side number one. Side number one, I think it's in English. I think it's underlined, you have that? They said, Rabbi Kiv had 12,000 pairs of disciples, you have that? Yeah. From Givas until Antiparis. Why should I care where they were? 
Why should I care where they were? Stay tuned. Why tell us their location? Stay tuned. Stay tuned why we need to know that. If you read the works of uh, Josephus, where the Bar Kokhba rebellion break out? It broke out in this place called what? What? Give out anti Paris. That was where the Bar Kokhba rebellion broke out in northern Yehuda. You hear this? Rav Shira Gohan says that these Talmidim died because they were part of our Kochba's army. Do you hear this? And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Otherwise, why do I need to know where the location is? Why is that important? Why is that important? We'll see in a minute. So they stopped dying. And the Rajbi died today. So the Chassam Sofer says, I don't understand, because somebody stops dying, you make a holiday out of it. What do you mean? What's, like, what's the Simcha of Lag Bomer? They stopped dying, and the Rajbi died. So when a Tzaddik dies, you make a Yontif? Isn't that strange? When a Tzaddik dies, you make a Yontif? Well, the death of a Tzaddik is called Halula. You know what Halula means? Halula means a wedding. When a tzaddik dies, it's called halula. Reunited and it feels so good. When a tzaddik dies, he's reunited with the boss. What happens at a wedding? So it's a happy time for him. But what about us? Why should we be happy? Said the Chassam Sofer, the real reason of the celebration of Lag Bomer, that's the day the man began to fall in the Midbar. The 18th of Iyar, which is going to be on Sunday, that's the day the month began to fall. Not, not you hear that? Not. So that's the real reason for the celebration, says the Chatam Sofer. Not, not the 30 days, which would be uh, Pesach Shani yesterday? No, not Pesach Shani. Pesach Shani. If you look in Exodus 17, you'll see that the month began to fall on the 18th of Iyar, which happens to be when? Like Bomer. So that's the reason for the celebration. So how come there's the old cover-up, Rabbi Avram? If I wouldn't have told you, you wouldn't know. How come the Torah doesn't make it official? Why is it like covered up? It's on the wraps. The month began to fall. Isn't that a great miracle? Yeah. So why isn't it stated in the Torah? Why is it hidden? So some cipher says, because how did we get the month? We began to complain and bellyache. We get bad to complain. Look, Sukkot, the magic clouds of glory, we got a seven day holiday. What's more important? Donuts from heaven or magic clouds? I think donuts from heaven. So there's a seven day holiday to celebrate what? Sukkot, why is the, uh, the month starting to fall? It's not even a Torah holiday, it's covered up. So the Chassam Soifer explains, because how did we get them on? We began to complain and to bellyache. You have to know how to ask your parent for an allowance. You don't be broigus. So if the Jews would have asked in a proper way for the man, we would have gotten Monday. Monday, Monday. Uh, but since we bellyached and complained, God says you forfeited the holiday. Now it's going to be covered up, shrouded in mystery under the table. So when you want to ask God for something, do it in a nice way. Like ask anybody, do it in a nice way. Don't be upset and angry and demanding. And that's the lesson why the man, like Bomer, is shrouded in mystery. But that's the day the man began to fall. The Chassam Soifer says, and that's the real reason for the celebration. But getting back to Rabbi Kiva's Talmidim, were these guys out to lunch? Rabbi Akiva taught that the greatest principle of the Torah is to what? Love your fellow Jew. He is just like you. And these guys were what? Competing. Jealous. Jealous. <laughs> so when the Rabbi Kiva 
teach this lesson? After, who said that? The Chama. He realized that no matter how great Torah scholar you are, if you don't have love for another Jew who needs you, after the fact, as Nechama said, he realized that all the Torah scholarship in the world is nothing if you don't have the love of another Jew. He only realized that when? After. Afterwards. Well, better late than never. Okay? Better late than never. But these guys, they didn't have covet for each other. They didn't have their for each other. So who needs your Torah scholarship? What a powerful message. They were very judgmental. They never gave each other the benefit of the doubt. They were always exacting and demanding. And be careful, because if you are so judgmental of somebody else, Loyalena, what does that mean? I think it's called boomerang. That's why God judges. Loyalenu, the Ariya Kodesh says this. The Ariya Kodesh says this. The way, the Mishnah says, the way a person measures others, he is measured. They were so strict and demanding of each other, so judgmental. So I think it's called boomerang, therefore God judged them the same way. Ah, what's the message? Don't be so judgmental and rush to conclusions and be so demanding because that's the way you treat others like Elenu, that's the way God will treat you uh, Mida Keneged Mida says the Ariya Kadosh wow wow hmm. so anyway how did these guys die in such a short amount of time and why is it important where the location was so if you turn over your page I think it says side number three. Hmm? Uh -huh. Side number three. Now, why did God give us a fiery Torah? Fiery people. Who said that? You did on top of the Ooh, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> a fiery Torah. Deuteronomy 32 says God gave us a fiery Torah amidst the fire, from the mountain on fire, the burning bush. What's the fire? Fiery Torah for fiery people. Mimino uh, dat from God's right hand, so to speak, a fiery Torah. Uh. The Talmud makes a strange statement. We are fiery people. If God would not have given us the Torah, we would have destroyed the world. Yedis Nechama? Tractate Beitza 25 says that God had to give us the Torah. Down boy! Because we're such a fiery people, without the discipline of the Torah, we would have destroyed the world. Mm, don't let Abu Mamzer hear this. Or the Donald is calling, don't tell the Donald that either. Mm. Now, let's find out what's going on over here. How did these Talmudim die? So, if you look at side number three, halacha, this is the Rambam, halacha gimel. Should I translate it in English? It's in Hebrew. Don't think that the Melech HaMashiach has to do great marvels and wonders, says the Rambam. See that? Halacha Gimel, there's a check there, I'll translate. Don't think that the Melech HaMashiach is going to be a, a miracle worker and will do wondrous thing or resurrect the dead. That's not his job. Eina Dovakach. Sherei Rabbi Akiva, you have that, Sarah? Rabbi Akiva, Chacham Godlov of Mechach Mishnah Hoya. Who was the greatest sage of the Mishnah? Who? And he was the arms bearer of whom? Bar Kokhba. I think it's underlined. You have that, uh, Sarah? And he proclaimed Melech HaMashiach. The greatest sage in the Mishnah proclaimed Bar Kokhba to be what? The Melech HaMashiach. And and once Rabbi Kiva proclaimed Bar Kokhba the Mashiach, all the other sages, what? 
joined in. They all proclaimed the Mashiach about 1900 years ago. How do they know that he wasn't? Once he's dead, he can't be the Mashiach. Some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. Once a person dies, only then did they realize that he's not Mashiach. And the rabbis never asked Bar Kokhba for any what? Wonder of wonder, miracles of miracles. <laughs> so says the Ramam, you see that the Mashiach is not going to be a miracle worker. No. You hear this? Now where was I? <clears throat> now, Rabbi Kiva proclaimed Bar Kokhba to be the Messiah. When did he know that he wasn't? When he, when he was dead. If you're dead, you can't be the Mashiach. That is the wrong religion. Don't confuse me with the facts. Who said that? I just did. Right now, on. yes? Uh, what, what will uh, Mashiach Ben Ephraim do? Uh, the Shiach Ben Yosef. That's a separate topic. Don't confuse me. That's separate. But let's stick to the text. I got a lot of material to cover. Now, you see I wrote in my uh, footnote there, it's probable. See, it says it's probable. In my handwriting, in the right column, you don't know. Yes. That his students took part to bring the final redemption. Rabbi Kiva proclaimed Bar Kokhba to be the Mashiach. That means Rabbi Kiva thought that the final redemption is what? Coming. Coming. So Rav Hai Goen says Rabbi Kiva's students were killed in the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Now when did Rabbi Kiva proclaim Bar Kokhba the Mashiach? 65 years after the Chorban Bayashani. What's significant about that? Fasten your seatbelts. When did Bar Kokhba proclaim, when did Rabbi Kiva proclaim Bar Kokhba the Messiah? 65 years after the Chorban Bayashani, that's when Bar Kokhba took up arms against Rome. Rabbi Akiva figured, how long was the Churban from Bayez Rishon to Bayez Shani? 70 years. Rabbi Akiva thought that Gam Churban Bayez Shani will only last, what? 70 years. Just like Churban Bayez Rishon. Therefore, says Rav Hai Goen, Rabbi Akiva sent his Talmidim in the Hester Yeshiva to go fight with Bar Kokhba. Because he figured in another five years, the final redemption will commence. And we have to make it happen by joining the IDF. Doing it ourselves. Isn't that incredible? Rav Hai Goen, a super Haredi rabbi a thousand years ago. Rav Abraham, Rav Hai Goen. And the revolt broke out exactly 65 years after Chorban Bay Shani. It's so significant because Rabbi Kiva thought that just like Chorban Bay Rishon lasted what? So Bay Shani will also last only 70 years. So we got five years to go. He told this Talmidim to join the Hezda Yeshiva in the Nachal Brigade. And they all got killed out when the Bar Kokhba rebellion was crushed. Great people can make great mistakes. The greatest sage we ever will have, at Marikiva in the Mishnah, he proclaimed Bar Kokhba the Messiah. It could have worked. Was he wrong? If they respected and loved each other, they would not have been defeated. Bar Kokhba's army was defeated. They began to hate each other, internal quarrels, bickering, character assassination, jealousy, sniping at each other. Sound familiar? That's why Bar Kokhba was defeated. Rabbi Kiva could have been right, Avi, if his Talmidim would have stuck together, all for one and one for all, and not to be so jealous and envious of each other. How do you say nishfraginen, a nishfraginer? How do you say that in English? There ain't no English word for it. A nishfraginer, I don't know how you say Nishfraginer, you know. Uh, the, the rebellion would have been successful. And Mashiach would have been here 2,000 years ago. But no. But no. 
You hear this? This is just incredible. Yes. He became conceited, same idea, Rabbi Koch, but the Rambam said there, Rabbi Koch became conceited, he started out on the right track, but then the power went to his head, and he thought that he's it. So it all went downhill after that. There was a frightening, at the 1968 parade, the Israel Day Parade, a year after the Six Day War. There was a parade outside Bechol Yafa, 1968. A gigantic sign, Yisrael B'tach B'tzahal. They corrupted the text. What does King David say? Yisrael, 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 B'tach B'ashem. And they changed the text in Tillim. Yisrael B'tach B'tzahal. That's why Nebuch, there was a Yom Kippur war, and therefore Rabbi Kiva, his Talmidim were defeated, and Bar Kokhba, when a person becomes arrogant and conceited and thinks that it's him, and he forgets his parent in heaven, then God says, Nebuch, Kindalach, I gotta give you a star kapach, Nebuch. Rabbi Kiva could have been right, Bar Kokhba could have been the Messiah. But it all fell apart, because great people have great egos. And since they were great people, Rabbi Kiva Stamida were great people, but they had great egos, and it destroyed them. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. But just amazing, Rav High Goen should say this, and why the revolt began 65 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. Rabbi Kiva had a good memory. The First Temple, the destruction of 70 years. Perhaps the Second Temple, also the destruction will be over what? 70 years. So let's get busy. Join the Hesder Brigade, Machal Brigade, Haredi Brigade. Rabbi Kiva was a Haredi rabbi, and he sent all of his soldiers what? To the army. He didn't spit on the soldiers. No. He sent them to fight because we have to bring the Messiah. And it could have worked, worked if they did not become arrogant and conceited. Exactly. Like happened in 1968, exactly. Yisrael b'tach b'tzahal. You're corrupting King David's till him. <laughs> so Nebuch, we had this Yom Kippur war. Yeah, what? There were 24,000 Talmidim. No, 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 no. But anyway, uh, it's just amazing that uh, the Zara Kodosh says, the Zara Kodosh says that Rabbi Kiva and his 24,000 Talmidim were in reincarnation of Zimri and the 24,000 Shimonites. It ain't over till it's over. Can you imagine that? Remember back in the Midbar, the prince of Shevet Shimon and his 24,000 Hasidim couldn't resist the wild Moabite women. Where were the Rebbitsons? Out to lunch? Where were the Rebbitsons? She's going to come with a rolling pin. The Nasi of Shevet Shimon, Zimri, and his 24,000 Hasidim couldn't resist the charms of the wild Moabite women. Remember that? Yeah. So Zimri got speared and the 24,000 Shimonites died of a plague. Please hear me well. Rabbi Akiva was executed by the Romans. His entire life he was obsessed. He said, when will it come my moment to die for Kiddush Hashem? You never find any other sage having a death wish. Rabbi Akiva, you look at the tractate Manochot, he says, when will the time come for me to die for Kiddush Hashem? Judaism is all about life to life, l'chaim. So Zorah Kodesh says, Rabbi Akiva knew that he was a Gilgal of Zimri, the Nasi of Shevet Shimon. And he made a tremendous Chil Hashem where he and his 24,000 Shimonites engaged in what? 
in adultery with the wild Moabite women. Ter terrible Chil Hashem. What's the tikkun for Chil Hashem? Kiddush Hashem. So Rekiva figured that Chil Hashem to have relations with a non-Jewish woman, it's a terrible Chil Hashem and to cause others to sin. So therefore, centuries later, God recycled him. He came back as Rabbi Akiva, and he died for Kiddush Hashem. And the 24,000 Shimonites, they came back as the 24,000 Tamidim, Rabbi Akiva. And they had to die in the war. That was their, that was their tikkun. It ain't over till it's over. So I'm telling you the inside story. That the Zimri and the 24,000 Shimonites, when they had orgies with the wild Moabite women, a terrible Chil Hashem, God brought them back as Rabbi Akiva and his 24,000 disciples, and they had to die and get killed in the war, and somehow that was the tikkun for their Chil Hashem. So we see it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. Mm, who said it? Right? right? We got to pay our dues. God says, you can pay me now, or God is in what business? I think it's called the recycling business, or the soul repair business. Now, it's just amazing. If you go to a Teveria, you'll see the Ramchal's kever. He's buried next to Rabbi Akiva, the great mystic and Kabbalist, the Ramchal. He's buried next to Rabbi Akiva. He died at 40. And as he was dying, he told his Talmudim, bury me next to me. He said, bury me next to me. Please hear me well. The great Ramchal, the great mystic tzaddik, he died at 40. All of his life he was hounded and persecuted by all the rabbis of Europe. This great tzaddik and saint, hounded and persecuted in every community in Europe till he had no choice but to what? To move to Eretz Israel. He came here and he died in a plague. How old was he when he died? 40. You know what he said? Don't cry for me and bury me next to me. Know what he said? He said, Rebbe, why are you dying so young? You're such a tzaddik. Why were you so persecuted and hounded by all the greatest rabbis of Europe? Couldn't they see what a great man you were? They hounded and persecuted you. They accused you of being a, a Shapsai Tzvinik. He says, I'll tell you why. I'm a Gilgul Rabbi Akiva. And up to the age of 40, not only was Rabbi Akiva an ignoramus, he said about himself, I hated and hounded the rabbis. I persecuted the rabbis until he was, became 40. When he became 40, all for the love of a pretty face, <laughs> Rachel. She encouraged him, Rachel. She said, you want me? Stop with your shenanigans. Stop hating the rabbis and come to the Aspa Yeshiva. So from being a rabbi hater, ignoramus, he became the greatest sage who ever lived, all because of a pretty face. Talmud tells us that. He tells us, Talmudim, Shali, V'shalachem, Shalah, Rav Avraham. How do you translate that in English? I can't. Shali, all of my Torah scholarship, and Shalachem, and you guys, Shalah. It's only for her. Not for her, I would be the self-hating Jews for Palestine, hating the rabbis and persecuting them. It's all for her. Please hear me well. So on his dying deathbed, Ramchal said, don't mourn for me. I'm dying at 40 because for the first 40 years of Rabbi Akiva, I was an ignoramus hating and persecuting the rabbis. So God had to bring me back to be hounded and persecuted to know what it's like, because that's what I did. And when, when he hits 40, what? Beam me up. Beam me up. He fulfilled his 
He fulfilled his tikkun. He died on his 40th birthday. You could Google it. Erev Kiva became a Balshuva. Koinki Dinki? No. I don't think so. He didn't die on his 40th birthday. Ramchal died when he turned 40. Because that's when Rabbi Akiva began to become a Balshuva. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, isn't that incredible? And he said, bury me next to me. You go to Tavaria, you see that his kever is next to Rabbi Kiva's kever. Why was he hounded and persecuted? He was such a great tzaddik. He says, because I dished it out. I got to get it back. It's not a punishment. The tikkun is, you don't know what you did to the other guy unless what? You experience, not, God doesn't punish us. But the tikkun can only come if you can experience the hurt that you did to others when they do it to you. Otherwise, you don't know what you did. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? Mm? So, again, the Ariya Kodesh says that the, uh, the bonfires are a giant yachtside candle for whom? The Rashbi, who died when? On Lag Vomer. The Apostle can Mishle Ne'er Hashem Nishmat Adam. Why do you light a candle for a dead person? King Solomon compares the human soul to what? Candle of God. Light my fire. Avram, you know why? Look at a candle on the wax. The wax melts, but the candle what? If you take a candle, Rav Yaakov, and you turn it upside down, where will the flame go? Try it tonight. Take a candle, put it down. Where will the flame go, Elisheva? Why? Because the, the, the soul will rise up. The body, the wax melts, but that's not the person. The candle, the Ne'er Hashem Nishmat Adam, that will rise to the top. Moving on up. Moving on up. Hmm? So we light the fire. The Jewish people are compared to fire. The Torah is compared to fire. Handle with care. If a person doesn't have midos toivos, he shouldn't study Torah. It's a chil Hashem. There are cheret kodma la Torah. There are cheret kodma la Torah. Ah, if you want a chain, oh, Mashiv Esther Bam Kashiv from Bombland. If you want to become better, the Torah will make you better. But if you don't want to become better, you just want to show off and brag, the Torah will burn you up. How do I know? The 24,000 Tamidim, Rabbi Kiva, great Torah scholars, but they didn't have their inheritance and love for a fellow Jew. So the Torah destroyed them. Wow. The Torah destroyed them. Now, please hear me well. If you go to Meron on Sunday, I think they're called a Jewish Woodstock, you'll find something very strange. People will be burning clothes People will be burning clothes. They will be throwing clothes into the fire. Why? Why is it not Baltashkis? It's wasted. People will be throwing good clothes into the fire. There's a problem with Baltashkis. You're not allowed to waste anything that a human being can use. Uh, so what's it all about? What's it all about? So to answer this question, we have to ask another question. Why does a person tear his clothes as a mourning for a dead person? Why do you tear your clothes when a relative dies? I'll give you the Kabbalistic explanation. A relative dies, you feel terrible. You tear your clothes. Is the torn shirt me? It's a garment. The dead relative laying there, that's not him. That's his torn garment. 
So the Kabbalistic reason why you tear clothes on the death of a loved one, it's a great comfort. That just like my torn shirt is only a garment, it's not me. My beloved relative, his torn, broken body, that's not him. That's only his garment. His soul is with the big boss. Don't confuse me with my bodysuit. So therefore, the Kabbalistic reason why we tear our clothes on the death of a loved one, Le'elenu, it's an achama. Just like my shirt is not me, my relative's broken, torn body, that's not him. That's only his beged. I think in English you call it a spacesuit or a bodysuit. So therefore, pi Kabbalah, you burn the clothes on the Rashbi's Yotzite to focus that our physical body is just like a garment that the soul wears. We are not our garment. The body can be burned up, but that's not the person. The person is the godly soul. Rashbi taught, don't get too attached to your garment. Don't confuse me with my bodysuit. Now, I used to watch Casper, the friendly ghost. I'm dating myself. Now, I thought that I was wasting my time. That's what I thought. Who remembers Casper, the friendly ghost? Now, I thought I was wasting my time. But even as a six-year-old kid, you couldn't fool me. I knew that Casper was not the white sheet. I knew that Casper was what? Inside the white sheet. So the Rashbi, Rashim Baichoy said, don't confuse me with my garment, whether it's a white sheet or the body. Amen. Isn't that incredible? So I'm recycling that old show, The Casper the Friendly Ghost. I am bringing it on home. God is always talking to us, even in the Casper the Friendly Ghost cartoon. <laughs> but you got to see it. In a beautiful rose, the wings of a butterfly, God is talking to me. In a babbling brook. Who's babbling in the brook? Who? A Kurdish Baruch Hu. Who's singing when the birds are singing? Who is it? Hakadosh Baruch Hu. But you got to be tuned in. You got to be tuned in. God is entertaining and calling me, but sometimes I'm out to lunch. <laughs> yes. I heard that the reason why Homer is a happy day. Go ahead. Because that's when the students stop dying. Well, we said that, right? We, we, we just read that. Oh, I didn't finish. Oh, oh I didn't finish. Oh, let's go back to number one. Thank you, Masha. Let's go back to number one. Uh, let's go back to number one. Number one, number one, uh, number one. Uh, on the right side, Masha. Yeah. On the right side, which is more about the episode. Number one. On the right side, Tractate Yavamot. It says more about the episode, no? And they all, the 12,000 students died between Pesach and Shavuot. Okay? But the Shulchan Aruch says that they took a time out when? On the 33rd day. The 33rd day. Okay? Uh -huh. Right? But they died during this period. During this period of the Svira, when we're supposed to acquire a left toe. What do we counting the Svira? We're supposed to become kinder and gentler and more loving to each other. And these guys were out to lunch. Dafka doing the Svina, how do you get ready for Kabbalah Satora? Avi, how do you get ready for Kabbalah Satora? Becoming kinder and loving and gracious. But these guys didn't get the message. That's why we read Perkovos. But the counting of the Omer to get ready for Kabbalah Satora. Unite with a fellow Jew. Reach out to a fellow Jew. Don't be envious of him. Don't reach out and touch, reach out and touch somebody. Isn't that incredible? Left tov, 
the 30, up until the Lagboma is Lev, Lev is what, 32? And from Lagboma to the end is 17 days. What's come out for you 17? Good. Tov. Mm. You gotta have heart, lots and lots of heart. But these people just don't get it. Let me tell you halacha, I still got two minutes, don't rush me. More than two minutes. Practical example. The tour or the tour. Where does Shulchan Aruch base his entire code of Jewish law, Rabbi Abraham? The tour. The Encyclopedia of Jewish Law, 1348, the Rabbi Yaakov Alaturim. And the Shulchan Aruch took, based on that, there's an amazing halacha. He says as follows, when the Balkorah is reading, and he makes a mistake, 96 people will jump on him. Uh, you ever see that? Yeah, yeah. Hey, say, uh, oh. 96 people will correct him and yell at him. Not what the Torah of Chaim says? Keep your mouth closed. <laughs> Let him make the mistake to embarrass a Jew in public is much worse than making a mistake in the Torah reading. But no. <laughs> Some people are out to lunch. The tour, Encyclopedia of Jewish Torah of Law, says Bakar is reading and he makes a mistake. If you whisper in his ear, fine. But to yell out? You you're embarrassing in public. You're spilling his blood. But in all <laughs> Rav Avram told me a story. How do you know you're an orthodox shul? A stranger walks in. How do you know you're an orthodox shul? A guy walks over to him. You're in my seat. Right. Uh, what are you doing in my seat? It was three women in the women's section. What are you doing in my seat? And she says, you're sitting in my Nicole. Hello. That's what God wants you to say. Love your fellow Jew. He is just like you. Now I gotta finish on this note. It says the Holy Chofetz Chaim. Remember, you have to know where to put the commas. You don't want to eat your grandpa. It doesn't say love your you love your friend as yourself. It can't say that. It's just impossible. You don't know where to put the commas, Rabbi Avram. After Racha, love your friend, Kamocha, because he is just like you. What means just like me? You don't look like me. Huh? Created by Hashem. But the Chovetz Chaim says something else, Elisheva. Love your fellow Jew, Kama, he's just like you, says the Chovetz Chaim. Just like you love yourself despite your faults. Love your fellow Jew despite his faults. You can't love him like yourself. That's not possible. Chofetz Chaim. I'm glad I came today. Just like you love yourself with all of your chesronot and all of your faults, you still love yourself? Kamocha. So love him despite his faults. You got plenty yourself. And you love yourself. You gotta love a fellow Jew despite his faults. Ani Hashem. What does Ani Hashem got to do with it? Yeah. What does Ani Hashem got to do with it? We're all connected. Yeah. We all have a piece of God inside of us. Yeah. We all have a godly soul. We all have a Tzelem Elohim. So therefore, Ani Hashem, God says, all of you have part of me inside of you. So therefore, you gotta love him. Despite his faults, you love yourself despite your faults. Avi, isn't that incredible? But the Rabbi Kivis tell me them, they just, some people just don't get it. Some people just don't get it. And the greater a person is, the greater could be his arrogance. The granddaddy of all sin is arrogance. And great people have great egos. And the granddaddy of all tshuva, humility. humility. Humility, yes. I read after the Sixth Day War, some minister came from America and said to some Israeli generals, 
what your God has done for you. He says, what are you talking about? We did it ourselves with our strong arms. So came Yom Nebuch, Kippur. the Yom Kippur War. Right. But I got to tell you this. Yes, Kainalam of Sha'acha, a person can acquire his eternity in one hour. Avodah Zarah 17, you got to give the sources. After the Six Day War, I think you can film it, it's on uh, Google. Moshe Dayan slipped a piece of paper inside the wall. When he left, a reporter pulled it out. You know what it says? If I get, if I get misty eyed, you'll. Excuse me. It said, Me'et Hashem hoi tozot hi neflas beyaneinu. Me'et Hashem hoi tozot hi neflat beyaneinu. It's a post you can tell him. This could only happen from Hashem. Me'et Hashem hoi tozot. This victory can only be from God. Nifla. What does nifla mean? Oh. Wonderful. Nifla beyaneinu. It's a post you can tell him. Me'et Hashem hoi tozot hi neflat beyaneinu. So Moshe Dayan, the great general, wrote a puzzle can till him and stuck it in the wall, acknowledging that this could only be from God, Nifla. Nifla means wonder of wonder, miracles of miracles. The reporter couldn't believe it. A lefty reporter, this is what he wrote. And this is what he, that's all she wrote. But he should have announced it to the world. Okay. Yeah. But he, the reporter wrote about it. He didn't deny it. Okay. This can only come from God. King David, the end of, of the Hallelujah. Hallel. This is a nifla. This is wondrous in our eyes, said the great Moshe Dayan. But never the next year they had this parade. And they changed the text and tell him instead of Yisrael Batach Bashem, Yisrael Batach Batzahal Nebuch. He also gave away the temple. Nebuch. Okay. Shem Yazor. Uh, Sunday there's no class, but next Thursday, Avi, we're having a special class. Next Thursday, not Sunday, it's called Why Jerusalem's Name Will Change When the Mashiach Comes. That's next Thursday at 2 o'clock. Happy Lag Bomer. Thank you very much.